Welcome to the Deeper Dive. I'm here with the four pastors from uh, Bethel Church here in Eastern Washington. Once again, hey, good to see you guys. Thanks, Dave. And Thanks by the way, Dave, Merry Christmas, Christmas to you all. Yeah. And to all, a good night. Okay, not quite yet, Brooks, but oh, uh, we're just, uh, just getting rolling here. <laughs> Very enthusiastic. <so. laughs> exactly. You know what? I think we'll just kind of jump right into it. Uh, Adam, you have led us into this little series, kind of a three-week series on what you have dubbed, or you have stolen this word, of uh, repellent doctrines. I admit that word sounds really cool to me. Can you tell us again what what is a repellent doctrine? Uh, yeah, I stole that from C.S. Lewis, who would give lectures on what people would would think are repellent doctrines about God and faith. So basically, beliefs within Christianity that to the modern mind, to the human mind, are ridiculous and maybe even offensive to logic and to the scientific knowledge that we have. And so he'd address those things. And so what we were hoping to do is whether you want to call it repellent or even maybe to capture all of them, paradoxical beliefs about Jesus that we can get the whole picture of who he is. Cause we tend to, to say, well, Jesus, we, we tend to hang out with you know, the, the, the divinity of Jesus to the exclusion of his humanity or vice versa, or mm-hmm. Jesus is definitely a lion, but he's not really a lamb or mm-hmm. vice versa. And today mm-hmm. we're looking at, he's both high and lifted up and the one who is lowly. Um, so really trying to get a full picture of Jesus and helping us to, to grab a hold of all of that. Because okay. the way we're, we're called to live in light of Jesus is in light of all of those things. Is it a struggle for you guys to keep these two juxtaposed uh, labels in your minds? So, so let, me, let me recap. So we've done lion and lamb. Mm-hmm. Today, uh, just last week, you, uh, we, you guys preached on high and low. And then the other one was... God and man. God and man. Okay. Um, is it hard for you guys to keep these, these paradoxical labels in your mind together for Christ? Or is it... Not that hard. If I'm being honest, it's just going to depend on how hard I think about it. Yeah. I feel like with all of them, I can just like say them. And if mm-hmm. I don't think deeply about it, no problem. Yeah. Jesus is God and man. I know that. Piece of cake. Mm-hmm. But like if you stop for a second, like you really think about that and you're like, yeah, how, what? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's this thing that kind of came to me. Uh, <clears throat> I think there are a couple things in, in, in the world, a few different categories of things in the world that are hard to understand. And I think this is something that is difficult to understand, but if you put your mind to it and explore it, it actually enriches you and, and it, it's not going to drive you crazy. Um, I can't remember the name of the, but, but no, pardon me, so not driving you crazy. It's not, so you don't think it's quite, these are quite as bad as say sovereignty and free will. No, I would say that as well. If you put your mind to it and, and explore the depths is going to, enrich you you know i'll go out on a limb here and say yeah go ahead maybe if you're not a believer maybe if you don't have the holy spirit it might drive you crazy but i think if you have the holy spirit and these paradoxical claims uh will enrich your life what i was going to say is i can't remember the 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 theorist's name but there is a um a theorist that um uh, i I watched a documentary um called dangerous knowledge um recommend it for anybody it's kind of fascinating it talked about these these theorists and these physicists throughout history that were exploring theories that are really impossible to um, explain. And it actually drove them mad and and it (laughs) drove like drove them into psychiatric wards and stuff. One of the theories was um, the, or the, the trying to create the mathematical equation for infinity and, and you can't like the, and, and these people that are way smarter than me, right. Try to, if you can math, if you can figure out the equation for, for infinity, then, then we could, we, there's a whole bunch of things that would open up and it would actually drive them insane to the point where they would actually go into an insane asylum. I think there are, so there's things in this world that we can't understand. And then there's things in this world about God that if you have the Holy spirit in you, I think if you explore these topics, it's just going to make your life and your worship more full mm-hmm. opposed to just driving you crazy. And I think this is one of those things, like, I, uh, uh, like, like Matthew what? said, it's like, man, yeah, I don't really put my mind to it. And I don't think it's a negative thing if we, if we put our mind to it. And I know it's not what you're saying, Matthew. It's just, well, no, it's, it's not a problem for me because I, I don't. You know, it's one of the things that, that when I've thought about, I just, it, it, I think it does drive me crazy. It is not the fact that if you tell somebody, okay, you're going to live forever. It's like you just never die. But when you go the other way, it's like somebody who is, they were never born. They've just always been. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that yeah. brain just brain. does not compute. No. Yeah. How could God have always been? It's oh, just like... Yeah, outside of time. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that one is... Yeah, that gets me. Yeah, That's a more Lord. Bit. All right. So let me. you guys are um, having studied and stuff. You guys use a little bit of your own subculture language. Um, and so I'm going to throw out two words here that as we go back to high and low, here's some of that subculture language. Um, you guys have used the words, um, transcendent and imminent. Okay. So that has to do with this whole high and low thing about Christ is both high and low. So what, what do those words mean? What, let's start with transcendent. What, why, what does that word mean? And why is it so important? Let's take a stab at that. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it's the idea that God is so much beyond us, right? Like it, even to a point of like, it's incomprehensible. Um, Mm -hmm. He transcends us. Which is important, yeah, like just to to know about God, right? Like, we don't want a God who is just like us. Mm -hmm. That would actually be bad news. But his imminency, being imminent, is that he is near and by and fully present here. Like, that's another paradox, right? God is transcendent and yet fully imminent here. Okay. So putting those two together in one God is very difficult for some other religions, if even some of the, uh, the, you know, the religions that believe in one God, right? I.e. Uh, Islam and Judaism. Uh, do the Muslims believe in an imminent God? Do they believe in a transcendent God? Do you guys know that? Like uh, what? Like what would they say, or what? What do we? Yeah. Say what? What, what would they say? What, what? Which one of those two would they struggle with? Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you happen to know that? Well, it's been a long time since I've studied it closely. One of the impressions I remember it. Do you know the answer to this, Matthew? Because I was going to say, I sometimes in in other religions, and it might be. Um, Islamic belief too, like when they describe a transcendent God, it's a very imminent God. Like it's it's a very human type of God. Type of God. So okay. I don't I don't actually know. Like for I'll, them, I'll actually jump in. I, I mean, I've lo- it's not like I've studied this, but I've looked at it. Yeah. So in Islam, they are pretty big on that God is transcendent. Mm-hmm. You know, he is you know the Allah Akbar. You know, God mm-hmm. is great, and I think that does kind of get back gets back to the fact that he is far above us. He is untouchable. You know, he is perfectly holy. He is perfectly righteous and all that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But the fact is, he is not imminent. Mm-hmm. So, what, you know, we, we can call upon him, but will he actually answer mm-hmm. you? The fact that, you know, Christ would come down low to us would be imminent. That would be uh, close to us is is really rough for them. Mm-hmm. So, okay. Well, why, why is why why is the fact that God is transcendent? What, like, why would that be good news? Would that be good? Why Why would that be good news for us? And why would the fact that he is imminent then also be good news for us? I mean, the reality is that you need a you need a transcendent God to be beyond you. Otherwise, if if God is sort of on our level in almost any capacity, whether it's uh, the way that he thinks or his emotions or his power, um, then then that's what we have to save us, right? Then the things that we could save would have to come from ourselves mm-hmm. and if you've ever tried to do any saving of yourself you probably know that doesn't go yeah. so well it doesn't that doesn't really work out but then the flip side would be of course if he's so transcendent that he's never going to relate to us or be with us then we are still alone and like needing to save ourselves mm-hmm. that's a good, good way of putting it if he's not transcendent yeah he's fully contained by what we're contained in our limitations mm-hmm. and our perspective so being transcendent he's both more holy and just more gracious and merciful. Like his character is beyond us. He's, and he's not touched and um, pulled down by the things that pull us down. And yet he mm. fully enters into that situation because he's imminent and he's near and does what he needs to do to free us from sin and death and to redeem okay. us. So it's like he needs to be both. I mean, and that really does pull us back from the conversations we've had the last couple of weeks too, where there's some similarities to his divinity and his humanity lie in the lamb. Like there's some similarities, I think threading through all those themes. Uh, Brooks, you touched on something earlier. Uh, I think while Adam was talking about God, God's transcendent transcendence in his character, you had just kind of mentioned the fact that he also transcends time. Mm -hmm. So he's not bound by time, not captivated by time. Um, He transcends space. Mm -hmm. So he's not limited to a, you know, a house made by hands or a world or 
or that sort of thing. Yeah. And matter too. I mean, he, he's, <clears throat> he, uh, each one of us are made up of matter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We're made from something. Uh, everything we touch, do, feel, live in, drive on is made up of something else. It's made up of matter. God is not, he, he transcends matter, which is kind of interesting to think about. Like I mean, that, that's, that's a kind of a core doctrine of Christianity that everything was made ex nihilo out of nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and God is the only one that can do that. Um, and he's humble enough and loving enough to become made, made of matter. Yeah. And Jesus. Yeah. Which is profound forever. Can, can I ask a question though? So, so Dave, what you brought up, you brought up the point of like, Hey, here's other religions. Do they struggle with like one side or the other? Mm-hmm. Do you guys think like, just thinking of our like evangelical tradition, do you think we struggle with one side or the other? Uh, I, you know, I think sometimes <laughs> Christian music, I, I think it, it definitely, I personally think for the most part in today's Christian music, the modern stuff, it, it, it tends toward his, his imminence. The fact that he is close with us, that he's here. I think at its worst, I've heard people say this and I kind of cringe to say it, but you know, some of the music, Christian music is like, Jesus is my girlfriend type thing. Right. You know, some of that language is kind of, you know, I don't know, whatever. It sounds like a pop song or something like that. Yeah, yeah, so prom, I'm not a prom, song, just, a prom song for Jesus. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm that. not trying to just disparage it, but I, I think if I had to say one, I'd say that tends toward the eminence. I think a number of the hymns, you know, the older songs are written in past centuries, I think they have dwelt more on God's transcendence and th- really thought that through pretty well, Pro- perhaps better than us. Hmm. Do you agree? I think so. Yeah, I'm trying to form- formulate in my mind where like some of those prominent places are in evangelical because I know they're there, whether it's in our music or in the way that we conceive of God and talk about him. Um, and there's there's a spectrum. And sometimes it's, a spectrum within one tradition of mm-hmm. evangelicalism, but sometimes it changes depending on where where you're at in the evangelical world and the things you want to emphasize. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. Probably depends thought. on what part of the. So yeah. a little bit more fragmented in some traditions, maybe more than others. Would and and yeah. in different aspects of God's character too, I think, um, as well. Uh, yeah, there's certain traditions that are very they emphasize very much. Like I think of like the Lutheran churches, like they they emphasize mm-hmm. a lot like the law law um, law gospel distinction, which is not like it's. Like, we need that distinction, but like everything falls into that distinction. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, I wouldn't want to say this for every Lutheran because I don't know a ton of Lutherans, but like God's holiness, righteousness, and justice is kind of like the dominating theme, like the graveness of who he is. Uh, and the gospel responds to that. But it's generally, and there's other traditions, I think Presbyterians can be the same way where it's like God's like this judge wearing a black, like a black um, uh, robe. And basically the only image you have of God is like sitting in a judgment room and he's like either calling you guilty or, yeah. you know, uh, free, unguilty, non-guilty. But then you have other people like, maybe you're saying this in like the music with charismatics that they'll emphasize more of the the nearness and the love and the grace maybe of Jesus and I would, in their experience yeah. that Jesus is near and close and he's, yeah, I don't know. That's probably a really two broad strokes, but like. Yeah, Matthew, were you, are you trying to get to you add um, different traditions of, of evangelicalism that um, maybe make Jesus or, or God more approachable than others. Like I think of like a seeker sensitive movement or the attractional church movement that has by and large like, died out in, in America compared to the early two thousands. Right. Um, but is that what kind of where you were getting at the different emphasis and in, in, inside evangelicalism? Uh, no. So I guess my, my heart behind the question was like, we're talking about other religions for a minute there. And, and I think sometimes there's a, there's a tendency for us to be like, yeah, people do that. But then it's like, Hey, let's look in our own midst yeah. mm-hmm. and just recognize that we do that. Like, you know, like someone could look at what we say and how we oh, talk yeah. about God and, and probably could pick that apart too, because we do not have a very complete picture all the time. Yeah. So I didn't know, I didn't know pastorally, like when you guys are looking mm-hmm. At your own, I'm using the term tradition to broaden it outside of just Bethel Church, but like you look at your own tradition, right? Like yeah, okay. if there was a if there was a one or other, it was more of a pastoral question. Gotcha. I guess. <laughs> well, the passage of you know that we were in last week with Isaiah 57. Like, do you think that that would have been surprising to Israel that God is both the one who inhabits eternity, He's high and holy, 
but also like how lowly he is. That he's with those who are humble and contrite in heart. Like, do you think that was, even though I, I think they're, it's prolific in scripture, you can find it all over the place. Do you think it was surprising to them in their theology of God? As they thought past really about who he is and who he is for them? I'm, I'm sure it was. I, I'm thinking in my head of like, I wonder which one during that time frame when Isaiah made that prophecy it was. Because on, on the one hand, you would, yeah, like, I know a lot of that culture certainly was like, well, God is God, right? Like, and he's up there. And then like, if, if you're blessed, like that's the sign that like God has blessed you with stuff, right? Like hmm. that's your relationship with God. Like a lot of that infiltrated the culture. So the thing that God is lowly with the oppressed, that doesn't sound right. Mm-hmm. Or the, sin, the, the sinful in the Isaiah one, like even though that they screwed up, probably surprising. Of course, on the other hand, I, I'm like, they were being pretty flippant about his law at the time. That's why yeah. the exile you was think happening, about, so maybe not. You think about some of the, you know, the theophanies, you know, the appearance, the appearance of the Lord to various people. I mean, pretty much everybody freaked out. Yeah. When, when the Lord showed up, right? Mm-hmm. Except Moses. Just, probably, what's that? <laughs> Except Moses. Except Moses. Moses is like, let me see your face, man. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Hey, while I'm here, can you show me more glory, please? <laughs> exactly. I mean, they, they did. And maybe that's, you know, the Lord revealing himself imminently, but still he is holy, powerful. Yeah. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's mind blowing. You know, people, people, people ran, right? People, yeah. people freaked out. So, well, if we go back to the low part, um, I, I'll throw this out since I'm the one who kind of got us talking a little bit about the Islamic faith, but I think they, one of the things that is actually kind of repugnant to them is that our, this great God mm-hmm. would be so weak as to allow himself to be crucified on a cross. Like that to them is like, mm-hmm. you, you, like, whoa, you got to be kidding me. Like, why would you even follow a God who would do that? And yeah, that, that's what we find, right? So Adam, let me put you on the spot here. Uh, the other day, at a uh, at a at our Christmas party, you actually shared a, about Christ being perhaps being um, uh, in a trough, mm-hmm. right? Where when he was born, he was like laying in a trough, and you you said something about that. Do you, do you recall what you said? Yeah, which part? Because I, I said there were two. I yeah, there's yeah, two things yeah, that once you give both, you get yeah, yeah, kind of two uh, interpretations of like what does that mean? Yeah, I think I think there's I mean there's probably more, but the two that. I think are most present in the gospels. One is like the the fact that the king would be born in a feeding trough, like in a humble estate, in a no room in the inn, born with the animals, born in a feeding trough. Like he's the lowly king that stepped out of heaven, humbled himself, and became enthroned. Basically, I mean, in the Gospel of John, he gets he's enthroned on the cross. So he's just he's lowly, he's gentle, he comes for us. But also, like I I tried to coordinate that with what Jesus says about himself, that he's the bread of life. He came to, to give his life so that we can feed on him as food for eternity. Like Jesus is, he says, uh, that by John the way, 6. another, another kind of blind. Mind a, oh yeah. I mean, that's a mind blowing <laughs> text. John six is just like a head scratcher. You're like, wow. Yes. Okay. And uh, like the fact that Jesus is born in a feeding trough, I think speaks to the reality too, that he has come to be like food for humanity uh-huh. um, that we can receive him by faith. You know, the analogy for feeding on him is receiving my faith and trusting him. And by doing that, we like feed on him for into eternity. So he's right. come for us to receive him. Okay. You know, a scripture that I always thought kind of, at least to me, I think personifies a little bit of this Christ being both high and low, uh, being a part of the, the eternal Godhead, and yet <laughs> being able to walk in the muck and mire with us. Mm-hmm. That is, remember when he went up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the other guys? They're up there, and he is transfigured before mm-hmm. him. And uh, who was it? Was it... Uh, Moses and Elijah, Moses and Elijah yeah. actually spoke to him, kind of the, the uh, one of the prophets, and then this great the lawgiver. Mm-hmm. So you have this magnificent scene, right, of, of Jesus kind of just pulling back the veil of who he is, yeah. right? And then if you recall, they come down the mountain, right? Can you imagine the three guys were just probably blown away, right? Yeah. So they they come down the mountain. Do you remember what what happened right when they came down the mountain? And the yeah, disciples are trying to cast out a demon, and they can't. So now they're fighting amongst each other. <laughs> exactly. Okay, I mean, I just. I just, that just always just struck me is that yeah. you're up there, you know, in the presence of God, this tremendous, like the, the Shekinah, however you said, the, 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 out, mm-hmm. the glory of God. And then you come down and these guys are squabbling with each other. <laughs> like yeah. you, you cast them out. No, dude, you cast them out. I can't do it. I can't. You do it. Right. And they're just kind of going yeah. back and forth. And Jesus <laughs> just comes out and just deals with it. Just walks right yeah. into it. Speaking of that passage, I've got a buddy who's writing in a, currently he wants to work on a, an article he published on on the transfiguration and he he's done some reading and some research on it. And he, he told me about it. I'm like, that's fascinating. The fact that you have Elijah and Moses 
who knew Jesus prior to him entering into the flesh. Like they knew, they knew God through theophany, like the uncreated God, but had not yet seen him in flesh made of material. Mm -hmm. And then you have the disciples who are walking around with fleshly Jesus, and yet they have not yet seen him in his uncreated light and glory. Hmm. And so on the mountain you have like bef before Jesus and with Jesus seeing a part of Jesus they haven't yet seen. And it's like wow. a light bulb goes off for like Moses and Elijah are like, oh my gosh, we've been waiting for this for a long time. And the disciples are like, oh my goodness, Jesus really is like who he says he is. Which I just think is crazy. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, crazy. that's a good. That high yeah, low, yeah. it's all coming together and God's revealing it. So what did, you, what did your friend make of Peter wanting to make like build some little altars right there? Do you recall what he said <laughs> about that? Is no, like, no. <laughs> I should. Wants to make the tent so that we can just stay up there forever. I mean, that's, yeah. The, the impulse seems like it's it's okay. But Jesus is like, yeah, we're, this isn't forever. <laughs> Peter, well, <laughs> Peter you, you, don't, you don't get it. It's one, of my, it's one of my favorite lines is when they get up there and Peter goes, it is good that we are here. Yeah. <laughs> like he just has to say something. Yeah. So he just, yeah. and like, can you imagine the other disciples? Just so, like, you, just so you guys know. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. That's great. This is cool, guys. Thanks, man. This is cool, guys. I'm glad we're all it's here. It's good that we we're here. That's why I resonate with Peter. Being a youngest youngest sibling, I always had to feel like I got to throw, like, throw in my two cents. Uh, Peter's like, do you guys want to do this for the weekend? Like, I'll make tents. Yeah, so yeah. We can all hang out together. <laughs> Let's not let this end. That's hilarious. He's a seven on the Enneagram, man. He just yeah. wants to have fun and just be with people. Yeah, he's like, by the way, I brought my barbecue. I got my hibachi here. We're going to hang out. So <laughs> Clear my schedule. So in this uh, scripture we looked at, you guys preached on last week. Uh, maybe I'll just read it real quick. It says, For the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, says this, I live in a high and holy place and with the oppressed and lowly of spirit. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on and kind of gives us the kind of the goal or the purpose of this, which is to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. So, Adam, as you've led us into this little series, I think, I don't want to put words in you guys' mouth, but I think, haven't we all said that in the last several months and stuff through everything that's kind of going on with the church, thing that's going on in society, that a lot of people feel exactly this. They, they feel oppressed. They, they don't want to go outside. They feel beat down. Mm -hmm. And yet somehow this whole thing about Christ being high and low, being both transcendent and imminent, that it is meant to revive the spirit of the lowly and revive the heart of the oppressed. So how, how does that, how is that supposed to happen? How is transcendent imminence meant to actually revive us? Hmm. Well, you preached on that passage, Dave. What do you think? Well, I think it gets back to a, a complete God. I think, Matthew, in the beginning of our discussion, you were, you know, you were saying, look, you know, a God who is only imminent but is not transcendent, who is high, high above us, isn't he kind of just one of us? And yet, if he if he is so high and holy and other than us, how on earth can he relate to us in our brokenness and our messed up and our sinfulness, you know, and our up and downness? And I think those two things coming together in this one person of Christ, he he does revive us. You know, he he revived the hearts. You just think of the uh, the prostitutes that he revived, the tax collectors he revived, people who are. Um, who were on the margins of society, he brought them in. Uh, you think about the woman caught in adultery, how he brought life to her. Um, anyway, I think that that's part of it. These people, you know, these two things, these two wonderful uh, repellent doctrines coming together in one person. Yeah. And by the way, I don't think it's just a doctrine, right? That's what we're talking about is who he is. Mm -hmm. right? Like that's just a revelation of who God is. Yeah. Well, I think part of the, the revival happens in how we respond to the one who's high and lowly. Because mm -hmm. even in this passage, he's talking about those, he's with those who are contrite and lowly and revives the spirit of those who are contrite and lowly. Like there's a, there's a posture of humility before the Lord where you're saying, like, I need you to revive me. And like, I have been, I have been wayward and I've been one of the wicked and I'm putting myself low rather than trying to rise ourselves up in pride and mm -hmm. self-sufficiency. I got this. Or even like, I deserve this from you, God. It's like, I'm going to make myself low. And like the promise of this is that God meets you when you make yourself low. Cause he's yeah. also lowly. Yeah. And so I, man, it's, it's a, it's an encouraging thing, but it's also challenging because it's supposed to bring us to our knees in mm -hmm. repentance. Yeah. And like, there's the promise that he's there to, to revive you. I think it's a good word, man. So who's not going to be revived? Yeah, the one who doesn't want to. The one oh, who's hey, prideful right. and arrogant. And yeah, thinks, the wicked. Thinks he's high. 
<laughs> and the wicked here, it's not the one that says that's that struggles with sin. The wicked is the one who is adamant to stand against God's will mm. and won't make himself or herself low. Yeah. But there's an invitation for all to make themselves low, I think. Is that yeah. really those who are far and those who are near. Yeah, right. Which sounds almost like, you know, in that Old Testament setting, like he's almost saying those who are far and near. Yeah. Possibly that could be a reference to the exile, yep. right? They're near as far, or it could also be possibly to the nations. Mm-hmm. Jew and Gentile. It's unthinkable, yeah. Well, and think what he's saying. He's like, the, the one who was for unjust gain, I was angry. I struck him, I hit my face, but he went on backsliding, and I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. Yep. I'll so it's like, it. when you put an end to wickedness and make yourself low, yeah. you are a recipient of God's making him, himself low for you. Yeah. Like, so much of it is like, you just need to know, like, what are you really oppressed, right? Like, yeah. everyone is actually oppressed. We're oppressed by sin. Mm-hmm. Death, judgment, mm-hmm. and it just made me think of Luke chapter four when he comes out of the temptation in the wilderness and he pulls a scroll from Isaiah and he talks about that freedom as his mission statement. Mm. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery mm-hmm. of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Yeah, that's good news. Mm-hmm. I'll add to this. This is, I, I just looked this up. Isaiah fifty seven eighteen. Here's the Lord says, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners. Man, I just see the Lord taking the initiative on this whole thing. Exactly. It's like, look, you guys can't, you guys just can't do it. I'm, I'm going to come. I'm going to heal you. I'm, I'm going to pave the way. Hmm. Well, gentlemen, I think we've been on a little bit of a holy ground today. At least that's how it feels to me, right? Looking at the character of God, who he is. And uh, man, I just, I just praise God. We know him. We get, uh, we're actually in a position where we get to, like it's our job to talk about it, to reveal who he is to, to people. Well, once again, I thank you, I thank you guys for your good uh, teaching, your good leading. Appreciate you guys. Thank you, Dave. Thanks.